to him who sits on heaven's love see Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to Good morning, everyone. Welcome this Lord's Day to the Real Tree Church. We're excited that you're here to worship with us. Uh, we believe God has brought you here for a specific reason, and that's to hear His Word, uh, to be changed by it, and to glorify Him as you go about your lives. Some announcements that I want to share. Uh, in the back pew in the church, you'll see a box with these bottles in there. They are for the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. Uh, we encourage you to pick one up, and you can use them a couple of different ways. You could fill them with change. Uh, you could rip the envelope off the front and use it to drink water. Uh, but the envelope is an important piece. If you look through the bottle, you will see on the back uh, that you can put information on there about uh, your offering, if you're just writing a check or uh, putting cash uh, in the envelope, uh, but be sure to add your name to it. Uh, the offering, 100% of it, there's no administrative fees or anything like that taken out, uh, but the funds are being collected uh, primarily for church planters uh, in the uh, North American region. Uh, 
this is a, uh, an effort that has a, a strong history in the Southern Baptist Church, and we encourage you to, to come alongside these brothers and sisters uh, that are working in the field uh, to evangelize and further the kingdom. Uh, secondly, we're uh, some important wording here. We are considering VBS for 2018. Uh, considering is a key term in that. Uh, the activities of the church really don't go forward without the involvement of the church. And uh, we need some volunteers to come alongside uh, to help accomplish that program if we're going to do it this year. Uh, so if you're interested in vol volunteering, please speak to uh, Becky when it's convenient. Uh, the next Young Adults Group will meet uh, April 7th, uh, so make sure that's on your uh, schedule. Uh, finally, if you are a new, uh, if you're new to the church, visiting for the first time, or a longer term visitor, or if you're a member of the church and you have some prayer concerns and praises, uh, be sure to use the sidebar uh, on our um, program. Please fill that out and put that in the offering plate for us. Last week, we read Psalm 89, in particular looked at verses 19 through 37. These verses focus on the covenant between David and the Lord. Ethan was writing this psalm, uh, chronicling some uh, persecution, some trials for the nation of Israel. That section of verses 19 through 37 focused on God's covenant, looking at God's promises for the nation of Israel, uh, specifically to David, uh, but to his lineage that continues on. This covenant was guaranteed by God's oath in Genesis 12 and continues until its fulfillment through Jesus' birth, life, death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and eventual return. The strength of a covenant over a contract, again, is that even when the party with whom the Lord makes this agreement breaks its terms, its binding nature obligates God to fulfill its terms. The text so far has built us up, giving us great hope in God's past faithfulness to his people and a future restoration. In today's section, the psalmist, Ethan, returns to his current setting. Again, namely, David's kingdom is under attack, the nation of Israel is laying in ruins, and its people are being dispersed throughout the surrounding nations. Despite the oath of David, or excuse me, of God to David's predecessors and to the king himself, we are returned to a harsh reality. Ethan brings us back with a very simple but powerful word in the text, but. The psalmist's complaint is littered with words that betray great depth of emotion. He uses adjectives like rejected, spurned, very angry, renounced, defiled, broken through, reduced to ruins, put an end to, cast to the ground, cut short, and covered with shame, to name a few. The acts of casting the crown into the dust, spurning the covenant and destroying the fortifications we hear in the first few lines would usually be associated with the activities of surrounding kingdoms. Here, however, God himself is the perpetrator of these hostile acts through human activity. We feel the depth of despair and is this despair that we often relate to in our own pain and disappointment, even in God himself, if we're honest. Who amongst us has not said, how long, Lord? Will you hide yourself forever? How can these realities be reconciled with God's love, his faithfulness, and covenant promises celebrated in the first 37 verses of this psalm? The psalmist believes that God's love is forever, Yet he is also fully aware that human beings, creatures of God, are also subject to God's freedom. So let's read from God his word to us. Join me as we read Psalm 
89 verses 38 through 52. But now you have cast off and rejected. You are full of wrath against your anointed. You have renounced the covenant with your servant. You have defiled his crown in the dust. You have breached all his walls. You have laid his strongholds in ruins. All who pass by plunder him. He has become the scorn of his neighbors. You have exalted the right hand of his foes. You have made all his enemies rejoice. You have also turned back the edge of his sword, and you have not made him stand in battle. You have made his splendor to cease and cast his throne to the ground. You have cut short the days of his youth. You have covered him with shame. How long, O Lord? Will you hide yourself forever? How long will your wrath burn like fire? Remember how short my time is. For what vanity you have created all the children of man. What man can live and never see death? Who can deliver his soul from the power of Sheol? Lord, where is your steadfast love of old, which by your faithfulness you swore to David? Remember, O Lord, how your servants are mocked, and how I bear in my heart the insults of all the many nations, with which your enemies mock, O Lord, with which they mock the footsteps of your anointed. Blessed be the Lord forever. Amen and amen. Let's pray. Father, what a shocking contrast in the psalmist's emotions at the end. Our lives are filled with the same questions and concerns as this psalmist. How long does your wrath last? Do you understand our frailty? Are you true to your nature? And yet the writer finishes with the affirmation of God's love. This is the pattern you intend us to embrace in Ethan's song and throughout the psalms. But how do we do this? The key, like last week's portion of this psalm, lies in the process of reciting your story of salvation throughout history that is found in Scripture. Lord, you alone are the faithful one, the king who decrees promises to his creation. Then, despite our unfaithfulness, provides a cure to our separation. Although your law spelled out and required in the covenant identifies the guidelines of a lasting relationship with you, we find that we are unable to live up to them. Paul tells us that breaking even one small aspect of the guidelines for living in your holy presence shows us to have broken all of these laws. Amazingly, at the end of this hopelessness and helplessness, we find that you have created a way to reconcile sinful man to a holy, set-apart God. Only by faith in your Son and through the work that he has done on the cross can we find our justification in life itself. Only through Christ can we, like Ethan, say, Blessed be the Lord forever. Amen and amen. We pray today that as the author and perfecter of our faith, that you revive our hearts in this reality. We may not understand the goal of the trials and pain we endure each day, yet may we cling to the truth that you are the one that motivates our faith. As a perfect sacrifice to atone for our sins, you at the same time are the object of a faith, of our faith. What a great mystery, what a profound love you have for us. Draw us to you as only you can do, and may all other things in this world indeed grow strangely dim in the light of your glory and grace. To the glory of your name, everyone said, Amen. Let's stand and lift our voices in praise to our great God. Like a bird from prison bars. 
Heavenly Father, we praise you and give you glory this morning. Lord, we are so thankful to meet together in this place because he lives. Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts and minds now as we uh, dig into a, a text that's a little hard for us to hear. Lord, that you would help us to understand what you have in it for us and, and that it would penetrate our hearts. Lord, we, we give you the glory in all things and pray that your will would be done in Jesus' name. Amen. Take a second and greet somebody. Say hi to your neighbor. A little force fellowship. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Real Tree Church. We just got back from three days of a pastor's conference with John MacArthur out in California. And so we have been hit in the face with a fire hose of information for three days. And those guys preach for over an hour, so uh, you won't mind if we continue to go. You guys got later lunch plans? We can start preaching for an hour. No, I'm just kidding you. I'm just kidding. It was a blessing to be out there. And you know, I was telling Todd beforehand that to uh, be in a building with 4,000 pastors, and those guys are all singing at the top of their lungs. You couldn't even hear the accompanying music. is breathtaking. So next week as we start to worship, I will be expecting that from you people to sing at the top of your lungs till we came and hear the music. Okay? Okay. Well, this Lord's Day, we'll be continuing our study of Matthew's Gospel, so I invite you to take your Bibles in hand and turn with me over to Matthew chapter 12. 
This week we will be taking a look at verses 33 through 37. Matthew chapter 12, verses 33 through 37. In our passage last week, we again witnessed the escalation of the conflict between the Jewish leaders and the Lord Jesus Christ. In our passage two weeks ago, the Pharisees had accused our Lord of doing the supernatural things, his miracles, the things that he did by the power of Satan. And then last week we saw that accusation result in blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, which our Lord then makes clear is the unforgivable sin, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Our God is a forgiving God and forgives us of all sorts of wicked things, including idolatry, which all of us are very good at. The human heart is an idol factory. But we simply cannot out God's grace. Not that we should try by any means, but God is glorified in justifying us through the faithfulness of the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we come to Him in repentance and faith, He forgives us and He separates us from our sin. And Scripture says He separates us as far as the east is from the west. However, there is one sin that is unforgivable. Our Lord calls it blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. It is to come to fully understand and even believe the gospel. It is to come to fully know and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, but to reject Him anyway. And not only reject Him, but also then to label our Lord, the Holy Spirit, God the Father, and Christianity as a whole as evil, and even deceitful. As D.A. Carson said last week, it is determined unbelief. It is being determined to not believe. In other words, you believe and know that it is true and right, but make up your mind to reject it anyway. That is what the Pharisees were in the process of doing. They knew that there was no way the things that our Lord was doing and saying could be from any other source other than the Spirit of God, yet they said, no, it must be Satan. And they rejected him and hated him. The good news is God will forgive all our sins when we seek him and repent. The bad news is if you are coming here week in and week out, hearing and understanding yet rejecting, then you're walking a very, very dangerous path. I urge you to repent and trust in Christ today. Don't reject the goodness and mercy of the Savior. In our passage this week, as we move along, our Lord is still engaged with the Jewish leadership. This is still the same conversation that's been taking place over the last several weeks. The scene has not changed. Our Lord is still schooling the Pharisees. and, And in our text this week, he gets right to the heart of the matter. No pun intended. The mouth reveals what is in and the condition of the heart. Let's go now to our text. I invite you to stand with me in reverence for the reading of the word of the living God. Matthew chapter 12, verses 33 through 37. Our Lord says, Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. The good person out of the good treasure brings forth good. And the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. You will be condemned. This is the word of the living God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come into your throne room this morning and we ask that you help us to understand what you have here for us. We ask you to to change our hearts where it's necessary. To awaken our conscience to the things that we are saying. To help us to understand that how we speak reveals the condition of our heart. Lord, grant us repentance and faith. Draw those to yourself who or here or listening online that don't know you today, this day. God, 
God, we praise you and give you the glory in all things and, and pray that your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. It's through Jesus we pray. Amen. You can have a seat. I did a little bit of research just to find out how many words the average person speaks in a day. And I know that you're going to find this hard to believe, but according to a recent study, recent statistics, the average woman speaks 20,000 words a day, and the average man, 7,000 words a day. Now, those are not my words. I know, I know. I was also very surprised to learn that women talk more than men. It was surprising. But in both cases, that's an awful lot of words, isn't it? That's an awful lot of words. Most of us speak without much thought. We say what is on our mind or what comes to our mind without giving it much thought as to the value or, dare I say, the danger of doing so. My father-in-law has a very wise saying. He said, what says one needs to engage the brain before the tongue starts flapping. That's a good one, isn't it? That's, that's sage wisdom that's very rarely heeded. Everyone has heard the saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, haven't they? I used to use that one on the school bus when I was a skinny kid, didn't weigh 100 pounds, and the other kids were picking on me. The problem with that saying is that it's not completely true. Believe me, I've had plenty of cuts and bruises and broken bones in my life. And although experiencing any of those things is not pleasant, it is only temporary in most cases. It's temporary. Cuts heal. Uh, sometimes even when we're left with a scar, it may even become difficult for us to remember what happened to, to cause that scar. Bones heal. Bruises go away. But once something comes out of your mouth, you cannot take it back. You can't take it back. You can't just put it back as if it never happened. As a matter of fact, I found this interesting. Scientists believe that sound waves, waves never completely go away. They just fade beyond our ability to hear them. We don't have sensitive enough equipment to hear them, but they're out there. Think of that. Think of that. That means that every sorry thing that you and I have said will never go away. And furthermore, even if they do, God does not forget. God doesn't forget. Whether intentional or not, words cannot be recovered and done away with after they are spoken. Once it's out, it is out. It is not possible to leave the good and erase the bad. In our culture today, people, especially those who are left-leaning, have gotten far too carried away with allowing words to hurt them. I'll give you that. Words can be hurtful. But people are mean, and that's part of life. Lost folks will act and speak as if they are lost because they are. But those who claim the name of Christ are supposed to know better. And what you and I say reflects what's, what we truly believe, or sadly, in some cases, what we don't believe or fail to believe. And that is what our Lord is getting at in our text today. Let's go back now and dig in and see if we can wrap our minds around this very important subject. Take a look at verse 33. Our Lord says, Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. Keep in mind that our Lord is still referring to the single sentence uttered by the Pharisees found in verse 24 of this chapter, where they make the claim that the supernatural things that the Lord does, He does by the power of Satan. That's our reference. Blasphemy is the issue. Speaking wrongly about God. And in this case, the Pharisees are engaged in deliberate unbelief or blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And in the verse before us, our Lord introduces this part of His rebuke with a parable. The sentence structure is rough, and it doesn't translate well from the Greek to the English, but the point is simple. A good tree cannot and will not produce bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot and will not produce good fruit. A good tree produces good fruit, and a bad tree produce, produces bad fruit. Therefore, one can tell the quality of the tree by the quality of the fruit. So 
So now think about the discussion that our Lord is engaged in here with these Pharisees. The Pharisees are accusing him of doing good works by an evil means. They are essentially saying that our Lord is a bad tree, but they cannot deny the goodness of the fruit. Therefore, our Lord is saying, that can't happen. The tree is either good or bad. It cannot be both. And now verse 34 is his rebuke strengthens. Take a look. He says, you brood of vipers. How can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Let's take this verse a sentence at a time. In the first sentence, our Lord switches metaphors, doesn't he? He goes from trees now to snakes. That's what vipers are, they're snakes. And speaking directly to the Pharisees, he calls them a brood of vipers. A bunch of them. He's saying that they are far worse than just bad trees. They are a brood of vipers. They are a bunch of sneaky, poisonous snakes. I don't know if you've ever seen a viper, but they are well camouflaged. They can be mistaken for something that's good, like a piece of wood. But when one picks up the wood, suddenly he's struck and bitten by the snake, injected with poison. Here in Minnesota, you are not familiar with venomous snakes. There are, I don't think there are any around here. Where I grew up down in southern Illinois, we had several different kinds of snakes that were poisonous. We had rattlesnakes, we had cotton mouths, and we had copperheads. And copperheads were the most common they were abundant on the farm that, farm that I grew up on. Uh, the first year that we lived there, my dad killed 36 of those snakes in our yard where we were playing. But to look at one, if you didn't know better, it appears to be very beautiful. It is very beautiful. And it's also camouflaged. If it's laying in the leaves, you can't see it. So they're hard to see. But when you do see them, they appear beautiful. You see the, how our Lord's making this point? And in reality, though... They are very dangerous and even deadly. That's the way the Pharisees were. They perhaps looked good on the outside, but in reality they were dealing in spiritual death. They were dealing in poison. They were the epitome of religious corruption and danger. And being such, as the second sentence indicates in our verse, nothing good could come from them. But now look at the third verse in this sentence. This is where we start to get into some meat. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The NA, NASB is, is, translates this better. It's more clear. It says, for the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. The mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. This is very simple to understand. The heart, in this case, it's not referring to the muscle in your chest that pumps blood throughout your body. The heart in this case represents who you are. In Scripture, it represents the seat of your thought and will. It is your very character that our Lord is talking about. Your mouth will eventually reveal who you really are. Some quicker than others. Your words indicate what is in your heart. They indicate who you really are. They indicate how you really think. The mouth merely reproduces verbally what's already in your heart. It speaks of that which fills your heart. Your mouth simply reveals your true character. If it is full of sin, then sinful and hurtful things come out of your mouth. If it is full of Christ, then edifying and loving things come out of your mouth. Our Lord continues in verse 35. He says, The good person out of the good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of the evil treasure brings forth evil. He's saying the same thing that he was in the previous verse. He's repeating himself in a different way to make the very same point. You simply cannot produce something you do not have. Treasure translates the Greek where we get the word thesaurus. It means a box, really, full of information. If your heart or if that box, if that thesaurus is good, then you will say good things. If your heart or your thesaurus is evil, if your box is evil, then you will say evil things. Now, that's not to say that 
The evil heart cannot on occasion say or do something that's good. And neither is it to say that the good heart will not on occasion say or do something that is evil. Because until we are glorified, we will continue to struggle in our process of sanctification with sin in our lives. And sometimes that comes out of our mouth. But the idea here is the big picture. It is the pattern of your life and actions that are in play. What is the norm? How do you normally speak day to day? That's what our Lord is speaking of here in this text. This passage should make us pause and take note of our lives. It should make us examine our lives. It should make us examine our words. It should cause us to stop and think about how we speak to each other on a regular and ongoing basis. I hear how some of you speak to each other and about each other, and frankly, occasionally it worries me. Everyone in here is capable of, including me, and has said things that shouldn't have been said. There is no doubt about that. However, some some make a habit of saying harsh and hurtful things to others. James speaks of this in his epistle when he says this. He says, If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. What is James saying here? Well, he's saying that if you call yourself a Christian and cannot control your tongue, then you are lying to yourself and are, in fact, lost. Because what is truly in you comes out of you. If it is the Holy Spirit, then it will be loving and kind things the majority of the time. If it is your old sin nature, then hateful and hurtful things will come out of your mouth the majority of the time. Because your mouth is the ultimate expression of your heart. That's just a fact. It's a truism. We act according to our nature. If the heart is wicked, it is revealed by how we speak. If the heart is redeemed, it also is revealed by by how we speak. I want us to pause and take an inventory of our words. I want each of us to think about and pay close attention to how we have spoken to each other in the past. I want us to, each of us to think about how we've spoken to each other in the immediate past, even perhaps this morning. I want to share a cold, hard truth with you. If you engage in gossip and or regularly criticize others, you do so because you desire to promote yourself. That's just the truth of it. You desire to think yourself better and more educated or more refined than others, or even, dare I say, more religious than others. You may disagree. You may call gossip news and criticism an analyst or or admonition. You may even believe and claim that it's for the good of the church body. But God calls it the overflow of a wicked heart. He calls it evidence of an unredeemed heart. Folks, what you say and how you speak reveals the condition of your heart. If you love others, it will be revealed in the way you speak to them. Because the way you speak to them reveals what you really think of them. If you love only yourself, that too will be revealed when you speak. This is a truism all throughout Scripture. I'll show you one passage from the Old Testament, the writer of Proverbs. He says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit eat its fruits you have the ability to speak life into those around you and build them up and encourage them or you have the ability to tear them down and destroy them using nothing more than your words and believe me every single word that you utter matters take a look at the final uh, verse 36 he says I tell you pay attention when he says that I tell you On the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. We are going to stand before God and give an account for the way we speak to others. And what this means is that how we speak reveals the condition of our heart. 
What you say or keep from saying is not what saves you, okay? That's not what's in play here. Rather, what you say or do not say reveals the true condition of your heart. So your words matter greatly. Your words matter greatly. Dr. Doriani of Westminster Theological Seminary says, every word is significant for two reasons. First, every word can either bless or harm people who hear. Second, every word reveals the heart. Every word you say either blesses someone or hurts them. Therefore, it reveals your heart. If you seek to love people and edify them, you will speak in a manner that does just that. If you are a lover of yourself, then your speech will reflect that as well. And by the way, there is no private speech. God knows all and hears all and sees all, so don't think that you can hide. You can't hide. You can't hide from God. I pray you're listening to this. I had to do some serious heart searching as I was studying for this message. I know that I say things that are hurtful occasionally. I know that some of you do as well. Some more than others. And it's no slight issue either as we see in our final verse this morning. Look at verse 37. Our Lord says, For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Ouch. Now it is clearly taught throughout all of Scripture that we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, and not by way of anything that we do. So please don't misunderstand what the Lord is saying here. He is not saying that how we speak will be the basis of of whether or not we are justified or condemned. What he is saying is that our words reveal who we truly are. And on the day of judgment, who we truly are is going to be all that matters. What we say reveals who we are. What we say, especially without thinking, reveals, really reveals who we are. If we put our faith in Christ, then our talk and our walk will eventually change to reveal that faith. It won't happen right off the bat. It's an ongoing process. But eventually, more good than bad will come out of your mouth. If you remain in your sins, then your talk and walk will not change. But will remain wicked and self-centered. Dr. R.C. Sproul, he says, Jesus was not speaking here about the doctrine of justification. He was talking about manifesting what is in the heart. When we face God at the last judgment, He will rehearse the records of our own mouths. If that record contains a constant stream of empty words, those words will condemn us. On the other hand, if the words that came out of the treasure of our hearts reveal our affection for Christ and our love for the things of God, then God will bless us in that day. Jesus says in Luke 19 that he will condemn folks by what comes out of their mouths. Your mouth reveals your heart. I don't think I can overemphasize the gravity of this topic. It's a fairly certain way to gauge your salvation. If you're looking for a way to know, check what comes out of your mouth. I want you to I want you all to think about this very seriously and intently. I want you to consider what you're saying to others. I also want you to consider how you're saying it to others. Lots of times the tone of my voice is not good. And I want you to consider even the tone that you're using. Does it edify and lift up, revealing your redemption? Or does it rather seek to put down, criticize, and make yourself look good? You know if you'll be honest with yourself and you might as well be honest with yourself because everyone you're speaking to knows and more importantly God knows so I want you to take some time this week and examine the motives behind the things that you say and do because hear me when I say this you will stand and give an account to God for each and every word and the motive behind it you may think that it's something that that only you know, but I assure you that's not the case. God knows. God knows. And you certainly will not fool Him. Some of you know right now why you say the things you do. You don't need time to reflect. You may not want to admit it, but you know, if you're honest with yourself. Others of you may just be careless with your words, but either way, the focus is in the wrong place. 
you love the Lord Jesus Christ, then you will love others. And if you love others, your speech will reflect that love. So in closing, I think the application here in this text is fairly evident. We don't need to jump through a bunch of interpretive hoops to understand very clearly what our Lord is saying. What you say and how you say it reveals the state of your heart. If you are critical and judgmental, then you need to repent. You need to ask God to forgive you and ask him to change your heart. And I assure you, we all need to work at making sure that our words build up and edify rather than tear down and destroy everyone. Everyone in here needs to do that, including myself. So I pray that God will open all of our eyes so that we can plainly see the condition of our heart. I want to see it. I want to know where I stand. I pray that he will grant us all repentance and faith that we might serve him with our whole being, with our thoughts, our words, and our actions. I pray that you will not be thinking about someone else whom you think this applies to. It applies to you, each of you, and me. If you're genu genuinely redeemed, your mouth will reflect it. If you're not, it will reflect that too. So I urge you this day, right here and right now, to understand that you're a sinner and to repent of your sins and put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Forsake your sins. Get control of your tongue. Today is the day of salvation, and now is the accepted time. It's urgent to repent and believe today, not tomorrow, today. One of the speakers this week said, tomorrow is the devil's day. Today is the Lord's day. Today is the day of salvation. Repent and believe today and you'll be saved. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your mercy, God, that we all, each and every one of us, say things regularly that we shouldn't say. That we are in this constant battle of idolatry of ourself, of wanting ourselves to be on the throne of our life rather than you. And that comes out of our mouth day in and day out. God, I pray that you would help us to get control over that. Lord, I pray that if, if there are those here who more bad than good comes out of their mouth, that you would convict them of that today, Lord. We plead for their souls. That you would open their heart. That you would draw them to yourself. That you would replace that old selfish heart of stone with a, with a loving heart of flesh that only you can do. God, we love you and we are so thankful that you're merciful and that you don't just strike us dead the first time something ugly comes out of our mouth. But that you are long-suffering. I pray that you would continue to grant us mercy. I pray that you would continue to be long-suffering with us. And that your spirit would fill us and change us, God. That we might worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, as always, we give you the glory in all things and pray that your will be done here on earth, here in this church, in each of our lives, as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Ushers, would you come forward, please?
the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Have a great week. We'll see you next week. The heavens declare your oceans rise.